So we finally, and, and finally, I want to say um, that after all these years, 42 years, she's finally planning her retirement now that we have a department that's moving on its own. Our newest member, Ian Seda Irizarry, is also missing. But he's here in spirit, and he will be participating in tomorrow and Sunday. Quite frankly, he's probably finishing his presentation. Okay, so however, half of our department is here. We only have six so far, but we're increasing it by 50%. Thank you, Jeremy Travis and, Joan ba and Jane Bowers, our provost. <laughs> um, and here, Don, please. He's dressed for the occasion. Um, joined our department with me five years ago. And Matthew DeFour, who followed us the next year. Okay? All three of us um, are University of Massachusetts graduates. Um, also participating in this conference are two of our newest members who will join us in the fall. Josh Mason, is Josh here tonight or not? Well, he'll be here. He's here in spirit too. And Michelle Holder. Josh from UMass and Michelle from New School. So every one of our full-time faculty earned her, his or her PhD from one of these few remaining graduate programs, um, heterodox graduate programs, and we, we hope to keep growing. And we hope that there are more graduate programs um, that will embrace alternatives to neoclassical and neo neoliberal thought. This is gonna be one half of the conference. Tonight's plenary is just the start. Looking through this program, I don't know which one I'm going to. I am glad I am not speaking at this conference. I am because I can't decide which, which presentation to go to. Um, so you're only gonna see me now and at the end. So, um, so um, when you're not at a, at a presentation though, if you feel like it. Um, grab a cup of coffee, the cafeteria will be open for, with full food tomorrow. And it's on the second floor of our new building. And um, you can either eat there, or if it's a nice day, we actually have green space. In New York City, we have green space. It's called the Jaywalk. Isn't that appropriate? <laughs> okay, I thought so. Okay, so given this is our first attempt at having this conference at John Jay, we might run into a few snags, but we hope we don't. So don't worry if you get lost. I still can't find my way around it. You know, people th think they get lost in North Hall. That new building is, I can never find anything, but you'll find it. We'll get you there. Um, if there's something you need or would like to see, please just let one of our volunteers know. Or feel free to ask a board member or, or, or all our volunteers that are all over the place and without them we'd have no conference at all. We will do our best to help you out. One thing though, given the amount of people here now, you saw the lines getting up, going down isn't so bad for most people, so if you can take the stairs down afterwards, please do, um, and save those uh, elevators for those who really could use them. Um, so I'm sure you're all excited about getting this conference started, so I'm gonna cut my remarks short and introduce you to the president of our college, Dr. Jeremy Travis. You know I'm a trade unionist and activist, and I usually lock horns with managers and administrators. Well, lock horns is a nice way of saying it. Um, but I'm glad to say that's not the case here at John Jay. Unlike many places, we actually have an extre extremely supportive folks at the, at the top. I particularly want to, want to thank President Travis because of the it was his support and his encouragement and his delight to, to provide this wonderful space for our conference. He truly believes 
in the mission of the College of Educating for Justice and knows that we are all about whatever kind of justice we want, whether it's political justice, economic justice, poetic justice, or, you know, you can see all the lists of all the justices all over the place. Um, uh, but uh, they're taglines, but we like it. It was, Jerry's, it was Jeremy's vision to transform John Jay into a full, rounded liberal arts institution when so many others, is that me? Okay. When so many other uh, colleges are axing these programs. Next, next year, John Jay will be celebrating its 50th anniversary. And I'm sure under Jeremy's leadership, it'll be quite a year. In fact, at our convocation, we're having, um, is that public knowledge? I guess it's public knowledge. Um, Justice Sotomayor um, will be here to give the convocation speech to our new freshmen, or first years, I'd like to say. I don't like that term. So let's give a nice welcome to the man that made this all happen, President Jeremy Travis. Noise. Good evening, everybody. It's just wonderful to have you here at uh, John Jay and to welcome you to this I mean, way back there. There's a lot of people in this uh, in this room. It's great to see all of you here. I'm not going to take much time because I know there's lots of uh, important substantive discussion uh, that's about to happen right here to my uh, right with uh, uh, Cornell, who just showed up, uh, Stanley, and others. But I do want to take 30 seconds for a uh, unabashed infomercial about John Jay, just to give a little more sense than Kathy did about where you are, and 30 seconds for personal privilege. Okay? That's 60 seconds. Here we go. John Jay College, part of CUNY. We're delighted to welcome the Left Forum back to CUNY. We're delighted that the host institution within CUNY is John Jay. We think you belong here at the university. We also think that you belong here at John Jay. Why? Because we have, as Kathy said, adopted the motto, I've been here now 10 years, of educating for justice. We have 15,000 students who are here, studying here, doctoral students, master's students, most of them from the public schools of the city of New York and the region. They come here because they are gravitating towards an institution that says unabashedly that our mission is educating for justice. So we know that we're a college of criminal justice. That's our history. We're very proud of that history. We care a lot about changing the way that this nation thinks about response to crime and, uh, and things like that. But we are a liberal arts institution. Kathy mentioned that we've been reintroducing liberal arts majors. In the last eight years, we now have an economics major, global history major, gender studies major, only one in CUNY, uh, the uh, major sociology, anthropology, philosophy, law, and society. Why? Because those disciplines help us think critically about matters of justice. And we want our students to be educated by faculty who are also attracted to that mission. So I'm delighted to see that the economics faculty are you know, sort of, in essence, your host committee here. But there are many other faculty and students from John Jay you see here uh, throughout your three days of the left forum. Please spend some time with them, get a sense of who we are. That's the end of my infomercial. Here's the personal privilege. And I just had a quick discussion. When I, last time I saw Dr. West, I said, here's the, here's the, the passion of my um, scholarly life right now, is to help the country think critically about the use of prison. So three weeks ago, you may have read the press about it. If you haven't, I encourage you to check it out. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences released a report by a consensus panel that I was asked to chair, uh, very privileged to chair this, uh, that was asked, convened to answer two questions. What are the causes of the fourfold increase in incarceration in America? How did we get here? <coughs> Three chapters. We, I chaired a panel of 20 scholars who came together, historians, political scientists, philosophers, economists, technologists, lawyers, 20 of us. Three chapters on that question. How did we get here? What are the causes of the prison growth? I'm not going to even answer the question, you have to read the book. But the second part of our charge, well, what are the consequences of being here? 
having quadrupled the rate of incarceration over 40 years. We have to remember our own history. For 50 years, we had a stable rate of imprisonment in this country from 1920 to 1972. It started to go up in 1972 and quadrupled in the 40 years after that watershed moment. What does it mean to have this now social reality of having so many of our fellow citizens in prison? For them, for public safety, for their families, for the institutions they now live in, for our notion of uh, workforce participation of people who have criminal records and time in prison, for the communities from which they're drawn. This is not spread equally across our country, this fourfold incarceration. It's in communities of color that are already struggling with lots of other burdens, and now we're asking them to take on the burden of the removal and reintegration of large numbers of mostly men in those communities. And for our democracy, that's chapter 11, for the democracy, uh, for the democratic values of uh, this country. So I call your attention to that report because I, I, what better audience and what better, what was that word? Transformative justice, whatever that is. If, you, if you're concerned about justice and you're not concerned about this phenomenon, time to wake up. And I urge you to take a look at that report. It is the National Academy of Sciences. It has now spoken with the voice of science. They call themselves the voice of science for nation, spoken on this issue. Please take advantage of that, of that volume uh, as you do your work. I particularly call your attention to chapter 12. Chapter 12, I was just telling Cornell to pay attention to it. I gave him a, a four-page summary. Don't get, get the whole book. Chapter 12, we have statements on four normative principles from the National Academy of Sciences. First principle is the principle of proportionality, which says that you can't punish people for more than the offense should carry. Second principle is the principle of parsimony, he says that it's inappropriate in a republic for the state to inflict pain beyond that required for a legitimate social purpose. That's the principle of parsimony. We've forgotten that principle. Third principle, principle of citizenship, which holds that the people who are incarcerated are entitled to dignity and citizenship and that their period of incarceration should not diminish their status when they return home. Fourth, listen carefully. The fourth principle is the principle of social justice, apropos of this conference, which says that, you read the literature here, all of these are scholarly, this, this, we didn't make this up, this is, these are scholarly traditions. Literature that holds that an institution, a social institution like a prison, should, should be subjected to the same sort of principles of transparency, accountability, openness for journalists and researchers and courts and citizens to care about the conditions of those, of those institutions. And that, as with any other public institution, like schools or hospitals or you name it, those institutions are expected, under these theories of social justice, to advance the well-being of our society, not to diminish it. Those four principles, chapter 12, if you download nothing else, please download chapter 12 and the, and the, and the introduction and conclusion of a sense of what we, in the journey that we travel. 20 of us. Five meetings, very intense, a 350-page document published by the National Academy of Sciences. My personal privilege is over. Welcome to John Jeff. Um, by the way, Jeremy led that team. So let's give him a big hand. I think he called it a labor of love. Yes, okay. So uh, we're gonna get started with our panel. Um, I'm first going to introduce um, Ms. Amy Goodman, and she will introduce our panelists. Um, who are panelists or our discussants? How's that tonight? Whatever. Whatever you want it to be. We're uh, postponing Okay. Amy Goodman is the host and executive producer of Democracy Now!, a national daily, independent, award-winning news program airing on over 12,000 public television and radio stations worldwide. Time Magazine named Democracy Now!, its pick of the podcast, along with NBC's Meet the Press. Goodman is, what? Yeah. I know, well, this is what they told me to write, read here. 
Goodman is the first journalist to receive the Right Livelihood Award, widely known as the Alternative Nobel Prize, for developing an innovative model of truly independent grassroots political journalism that brings to millions of people the alternative voices that are excluded by the mainstream media. There's no comma, no colon, no nothing in that, so, okay. She is the first co-recipient of the Park Center for Independent Media's Izzy Award, named for the great muckraking journalist I.F. Stone, um, the Independent of London called Amy Goodman and Democracy Now! an inspiration. Pulse named her one of the top 20 global media figures of 2009. I welcome Ms. Amy Goodman. Well, I'm really looking forward to this evening and honored to be here and as we talk tonight about movements and the title of this evening, Why Revolution Now? What Revolution Now? Let's remember some of the people who've passed just in the last week, starting with Maya Angelou. Now, the media certainly has been talking about her significance, her poetry, her prose, her activism, but the brave activism she engaged in for decades is not told as much. She entered the mainstream consciousness with the inaugural poem for President Clinton's inauguration. But there she was when Lumumba was assassinated, as Sonia Sanchez told it on Democracy Now!, scaling a wall here in New York in protest. She stood up for Fidel Castro and the Cuban Revolution. She was with Malcolm X, helping him to organize the organization of Afro-American unity and with Martin Luther King. The histories of great leaders should not be whitewashed. And her bravery throughout her life, I was lucky enough having grown up in Bayshore, Long Island, when you know her work to this day is not allowed in certain libraries and schools because of the, her fierce prose around her own growing up and what took place, raped as a seven, eight-year-old child by her mother's boyfriend. He um, was murdered and then she didn't speak for five years except to her brother. But I was lucky enough to get to see her. Unlike other libraries, our library on Long Island invited Maya Angelou to speak and we went to this auditorium like, like it is here tonight. And I didn't know what to expect. I was a young teenager and this woman came forward and yes, she spoke. But she sang, she danced, and she made us gasp and cry and laugh. And she moved all of us, hundreds of us, black and white, together. What a remarkable woman she was, 86 years old when she died in North Carolina. And then there's other greats like William Worthy, a pioneering journalist whose name we all should know, who went to North Vietnam, he went to China, but when he came back to the United States, um, John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State, ensured that he did not get his passport for going to China, but he didn't care. He went to interview Fidel Castro in Cuba, and when he came back, they arrested him coming into the country. But the Supreme Court said, no, you can't take away an American's passport. And so he, his conviction was overturned, and he kept on going. And he should be known by all journalists and everyone. And then in New York, there's our own Alambe Brath from WBAI, who we just lost. His was the first program I heard on WBAI when I was just tuning in. As a young person, I heard Afro Kaleidoscope, this great Pan-Africanist, and A.C. Bird at Pacific Radio in Washington, a great atomic veteran who organized atomic vets and was a leader in the Pacifica movement. 
and Robert Knight of WBAI. All of these voices, they continue to resonate. And I was just reminded of another remarkable woman, Mother Jones, uh, with all of these people. We were driving in Illinois, headed to Bainport during the elections, the uh, people who were protesting, uh, candidate Romney. And um, we saw this cemetery by itself, the only union-owned cemetery in the country called Mount Olive. And there, Mother Jones is buried, protected by two statues of coal miners. Um, on either side, and all of these stickers everywhere that people continue to put up, um, union stickers and stickers of support and bumper stickers and messages, and well, you know what she said, and that's what we're gonna be doing today and over the weekend, pray for the dead and fight like hell for the living. Let's talk about what we're gonna be doing tonight. So, we have two speeches, and then we have a conversation, and we're gonna start with one of us. Cornel West, one of America's most provocative public intellectuals, who's been a champion for racial and economic justice since childhood, is writing, speaking, and teaching, weaving together the traditions of the Black Baptist Church, progressive politics, and jazz. Uh, Cornel West has written more than 20 books. He was a professor at Princeton, then went to Harvard, then had a fight with the president of Harvard, Larry Summers, and so he went back to Princeton, and now he's a professor of philosophy and Christian practices at Union Theological Seminary here in New York. So we've got him for now in New York City. We're going to hear from Professor Cornell West and then on to Stanley Aronowitz, distinguished professor of sociology at CUNY Graduate Center, where he's director of the Center for the Study of Culture, Technology, and Work. He taught at Staten Island Community College, University of California, Irvine, University of Paris, Columbia, University of Wisconsin, after working in metal working factories in New York and New Jersey. Uh, Aronowitz became a union organizer for the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union, founding editor of Social Text and Situations, serves on the editorial board of Ethnography, Cultural Critique, has authored and edited 26 books, um, among them, False Promises, How Class Works, Just Around the Corner, The Paradox of the Jobless Recovery, Left Turn, Forging a New Political Future, Against Schooling for an Education That Matters, and Taking It Big, C. Wright Mills, and the Making of Political Intellectuals. After they share their thoughts, we're gonna sit down and have a conversation. And we'll be joined by Marina Citrin, who is uh, an active um, Occupy activist. She's co-author of They Can't Represent Us, Reinventing Democracy from Greece to Occupy, author of Everyday Revolutions, Horizontalism and Autonomy in Argentina, and editor of Horizontalism. She is a student, a teacher, a dreamer, and a militant, a visiting scholar at the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics at CUNY. Our work focuses on social movements and justice. Uh, and we're joined by Immortal Technique. Um, recording artist and filmmaker, writer and activist, hailing from Peru by way of Harlem, one of the highest selling independent artists putting forth a combination of globally themed revolutionary music with a gritty reality based in hip hop. Not only is he an artist, but also a human rights activist that has traveled to Haiti and Afghanistan to provide relief through various nonprofits. He's participated in various workshops for uh, people in prison. Uh, as the president of Viper Records with four full studio albums, three mixtapes, with over 250,000 records sold, he has the hip hop community highly anticipating his fifth studio album, The Middle Passage. Let's begin with Cornell West. What a blessing to be here right here, John Jay. John Jay College, New York City. Oh, that is doing great folks. Very fabulous and the others. It's so good to see each and every one of you here. I can see your eyes sparkling because you're on fire, not just for justice, but we're talking about revolution. Oh, yes, we embrace the reformers, those who want to tinker. Okay, if you want to be incremental, Fine, but just don't stop there. We're calling for 
fundamental transformation of American capital society with its empire, keeping track of a vicious legacy of white supremacy, male supremacy. We have no room for anti-Jewish hatred or anti-Arab hatred or anti-Muslim hatred, and we're keeping track of the pressure. Gay brothers, lesbian sisters, and the transgender and bisexual, but we focus it also on the children, and I don't know about you, but I also focus on the new Jim Crow, the vicious prison industrial complex, and its relation to the Wall Street oligarchic plutocratic complex with vicious crimes being committed, but not one Wall Street executive going to jail. Now, Juan, let Jamal and the teachers get caught with the crack off to jail. I've been teaching in prison for 37 years. I teach a course on Friday night in Broadway, and we have a wonderful time with 150 brothers, 62% of them in there for soft drugs, and lo and behold, the vicious kinds of crimes committed in high places, they're having tea at the White House. Head of J.P. Ward Chase. What's his name? Jerry, Diamond. Yeah, we're talking about you, brother Diamond. Oh. <laughs> I'm a Christian, I love everybody, but I'm here to tell the truth. And the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. And too many folk are suffering right now. So I want to begin by invoking the great W. Beat the Boys, because it is true. Sister Amy, you're absolutely right. We've lost Maya Angelou, we've lost Vincent Harding, we've lost Amiri Barak, we've lost Alami Breath, we've lost so many freedom fighters. And each time I come to this gathering, I think, oh, brother Harry Magdoff, and I think of Paul Sweezy, and I think of, uh, now Baldwin's still around, though, isn't he? Baldwin did it. He has a cat, has he? He's still, he's still strong. Thank God Almighty. I haven't seen him in years. We've been at it for 30 years now, Brother Stanley. 30 years. That's right. Came up with the idea was Democratic Socialists of America. I know a lot of our uh, revolutionary brothers and sisters kind of hard on us DSA folk. If you think we all reformers, that's a lie. We got revolutionaries there. Oh, yes, indeed, indeed. I see Brother Carl Dixon. He's a bona fide revolutionary communist. Been to jail with him many occasions. We called for us to stop mass incarceration in October, day after day after day. I said, Brother West, how come you spend so much time with a revolutionary communist? You know you a Jesus loving free black man trying to keep track of the poor and working class? That's right. Because we believe in overlap. That a revolutionary Muslim named Malcolm X, we believe in overlap. That a revolutionary Buddhist named Bell Hooks, we believe in overlap. The visionary, prophetic, towering figure, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, legacy still alive, we believe in overlap. And of course, most of y'all are secular, agnostic, and atheistic. That's beautiful, too. <laughs> That's beautiful, too. But I want to begin my book in Du Bois, so I'm going to be very brief. He raised four questions, 89 years old. He emerges from uh, the court. He's in shackles. Why? One, because like Malcolm and Mark, when they tried to come together in June 1964 to put the United States on trial in front of the United Nations for the violation of human rights and religion to black people, the boys had just taken the United States, put them on trial in the United Nations. He and Paul Robeson on the FBI surveillance. And at 89 years old, he says, I have something still to say. I embark on writing three novels. And in that first novel, you turn to page 275, The Ordeal of Mansard. What you got to say, Buddy Du Bois, after all of your struggle trying to keep track of the dignity and decency of poor and working people, those friends for all called the wretched of the earth, what you got to say? Four questions. How does integrity face oppression? You're going to see a whole lot of wrestling with intellectual integrity in the face of oppression in the next few days. That's what this gathering is all about. That's why Brother Seth Adler and the others bring us together. And by integrity, I'm talking about willingness to think critically, vigorously, from the vantage point of poor and working people, to speak candidly, unintimidated, plain, frank speech in the face of how was that be? But also, 
to be willing to sacrifice your popularity, sacrifice your mainstream acceptance, sacrifice your establishmentarian affirmation in the name of something bigger than you, truth and justice. So we're not talking about cupidity. Nobody's here because of love of money. We all need money. We take claim and cream. <laughs> Cash rule everything around me, but it doesn't have to rule me. Around me. It doesn't have to rule me. We attempt to be a people of integrity in a moment in which the American if empires in relative decline, it's an undeniable decay. Look at the situation of our schools. Look at the souls of our children. Look at the condition of working people. Look at the ways in which women are being dehumanized, viciously attacked. Look at the way in which oligarchs and plutocrats have colonized the courts, White House, Congress. Look at those empirical tentacles. Keep track of those precious children in Pakistan and Yemen and in Somalia with U.S. drones dropping bombs on them. 224 children in counting. Every child has the same value as a child born in Newtown, Connecticut, born in on the east side of Los Angeles, born in Tel Aviv, born in the West Bank, born in Ethiopia, Guatemala, anywhere in the world. We intend to be a people of integrity. Second question of the great divorce, what does honesty do in the face of deception? And we're dealing with organized forms of deception. It's a lie white supremacy is, male supremacy is, homophobia is, losing sight of the humanity of working people and others is. Organized deception is intimately connected with arbitrary uses of power, especially from above. How do we become honest people? And when you talk about integrity, when you talk about honesty, it cuts across ideology. We're not talking about an ism. We're talking about a certain kind of people, a certain group of people who are committed to something bigger than them, radically against the odds, precisely because what Sister Amy understands so well, the weapons of mass distraction shaped by a corporate a corporate multiplex when it comes to media. That's why we love Sister Amy so. Oh yes, she's willing to allow the voice to tell the truth from the vantage point of the wretched of the earth. Sheer honesty. Third question of the Bois, what does decency do in the face of insult? And we can add assault. We can add attack. We can add character assassination. And yes, some of us must be willing to die. There is no movement for change, fundamental change, revolution, unless there's willingness on behalf of somebody to die. That's a fundamental fact. If all of us come together and we have no one here willing to die for the cause, in a sense it's still sounding brass and tickling simple. And that's especially when it comes to black and brown and red people. Especially when it comes to vicious legacies of white supremacy. People trying to keep track of those who want to tell the truth. Trying to expose the lies and try to bear witness in their own fallible way. We're not talking about self-righteousness. We're talking about a willingness to move forward in the face of the darkness. Trying to keep that flickering candle alive that highlights the plight of those who are rendered invisible. That's what we're talking about. Thank God for Black Agenda Report. I saw Brother Bruce come through, Glenn Ford, so many of the others, Margaret, Crystal Nelly, and others. We got to keep track of this vicious attempt to try to corporatize and marketize, marketize the internet so that we can't follow the Negro national anthem of lifting every voice. No, they don't want the voices of those who are speaking from the vantage point of poor and working people. They want echoes of those who reflect either the mean-spirited, cold-heartedness of right-wing Republican Party policies or the milk-toast, spineless, neoliberal policies of the Democratic Party. Both of them just echoes of oligarchic power, echoes of plutocratic power, don't want to tell the truth about the suffering beneath. The truth is not in the middle. The truth is beneath the lie of so much of our public discussion. So I'm going to sit down. 
But we're here because we're on fire. Yeah. And we're on fire because too many of our precious fellow citizens are lukewarm. They're too callous and indifferent to the plight of our schools being privatized, to the vicious attacks on the trade union movement. They're too callous and different when it comes to oligarchs and plutocrats on Wall Street and corporate elites who have been getting away with financial murder. They're too callous and indifferent when it comes to the national security state and the surveillance expansion that Brother Edward Snowden, thank God for Brother Snowden. Thank God for Brother Snowden. Thank God for Chelsea Manley. Thank God for John Perry too. Thank God for, for they let this whistle blow. The human beings who want to decide to be persons of integrity and honesty and decency. Last question, how does virtue meet brute force? Oh, here's the question. Brute force, you can't talk about change in America, reform or revolution unless you come to terms with the FBI and the CIA and the police and the army and the cannons and the cybertizing weaponry and so forth and so on. That's what we're up against. That's why people come to us and say, oh, Brother West, y'all talking about revolution. You know America, even if it needs revolution, it only has the capacity for counter-revolution because the right-wing forces are so strong. For every socialist, you got 15 members of the Ku Klux Klan. Oh, this is America, y'all. Let's be honest about it. Our struggle is not confined to the United States. We got brothers and sisters in Latin America. We got brothers and sisters in Asia. We got brothers and sisters in Africa and Europe, all around the world. This is a global affair. You got a global capitalist economy. You got a global working class. White supremacy, male supremacy, homophobia, anti-Jewish and anti-Arab hatred, global phenomena. So let's not become so obsessed just with the USA, that we can become so depressed when we look around and see 1,100 white supremacist militia groups, some of our names at the top, and say, oh my God, they got 1,100 white supremacist militia groups. How many left-wing ones we got? <laughs> well, we're working on our journal. <laughs> got nothing against journals, but it's lopsided. Lopsided, that's all right. Because when you decide to be a person of integrity, honesty, decency, with a sense of virtue, you do it because it's right, it's moral, it's just, and you're willing to pay any cost. That's why we're here, that's why I'm here. I'm so blessed to be here. My great sacrifice is to follow Cornell West. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. He sat in my class at Columbia for two years. Oh, yeah. And uh, now I sit in his class. <laughs> I want to start with a personal note. Of course, we're at John Jay College for 25 years. I lived with and was married to Ellen Willis, whose father was a police lieutenant and who graduated in his baccalaureate degree as well as his master's degree from John Jay College. And so I learned more about the police department sitting at Passover and at uh, Thanksgiving about, uh, about, about criminal justice than I could have learned from any book. But one of the things that Mel Willis always said is that people on the left never really understood the internal life of the cops. He was an educated person before he went to college. He went to college because 
because my mother went to college when she was 67 years old. 67 years old, she entered college at the Center for Worker Education at City College, which I helped establish. That was not because she, would, uh, uh, she thought there would be a career, or did Mel think he had a career because he went to college. He was already a policeman. They went to college because they were interested in learning. That is under threat today. People do not go to university to learn. They go to university to get pieces of paper. And if every now and then they see a professor of Cornell West, who, from whom they can actually learn something, they're lucky. Because so much of what is going on is not only the vocationalization of higher education, but the concept that we are not interested in education, what we're interested in is training. Training for jobs, and there's a dirty little secret, friends, jobs that do not exist. And so all the crap that we hear about, vocational, occupational, blah, 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 has got to be taken with a grain of salt. One of my books is called The Jobless Future. When Bill DeFazio, who's sitting over there, and I wrote that book in 1994, they called us crazy. What do you mean, the jobless future? We said that we saw the technological revolution underway, and that we had learned from our own experience, as well as from the books that we read, notably by Karl Marx, well, that technological revolution meant the reduction of the workforces. And now what we've seen is that the technological revolution has cut down 50% of America's industrial capacity. We have 8 million industrial workers and we used to have 22 million. That technological revolution has produced a situation where the service economy, the big box stores, the McDonald's, and all of the um, fast food operations are hiring college graduates to work part time. Let's not fool around. We are in a period in which capitalism has lost its spirit and every promise that it makes has been absolutely falsified, taken back, and they continue to make the promises. The President of the United States says that we have entered into a period of recovery. And the worker in McDonald's says, I, I ain't seen no recovery. 22, 23, 24, 25 hours at $7.50, $8.50 an hour. And now we're going to see in Seattle, one of the speakers tomorrow is going to have to not come on Sunday because she's going to Seattle and she is going to go home. She's a city council member, a socialist city council member, who's introducing the $15 an hour minimum wage. And the President of the United States says $10.10, and in Michigan they're, they've introduced a $9 and something cents, and it's not going to be mature until 2018. <laughs> People are going to hold their breath for $9 and something cents an hour. I have a gloomy message to, uh, to impart and also a hopeful message. Let me start with the hopeful message. We've seen a socialist city council person elected in Seattle. A member of the Baraka family will be the next mayor of the city of New York. I lived 10 years in the city of New York. And we had a, a succession of black mayors but we never had a Baraka. And we're going to see what happens now. We have 75% of the people of the city of New York voting for Bill de Blasio. 
We don't know what's going to happen with Bill de Blasio, but the early signs are that he's a member of the Democratic Party, the neoliberal Democratic Party. And frankly, I hope for the best. My daughter's best friend works for de Blasio. She was on, her cam on his campaign, but I'm not terribly optimistic. He's going to try to bring the Working Families Party back into the Cuomo camp. That's his job. That's the politics. So that's the good news. <laughs> Let's talk about the real news, okay? I mean, the, the, the other part of it. I don't know whether you have noticed it, but with the exception of Greece, where Sarisa got 27% of the vote, a left-wing party in the last European elections, the right wing swept the European elections. In the United States, whatever politicians' rhetoric are, the right controls the discourse. We are in a period, historically, when the crisis of capitalism, which is endemic to the entire capitalist world, has not benefited primarily the left. I will exempt parts of Latin America, because you know about that. And perhaps it's true of Greece as well, although that's still early. The military is still waiting in the barracks. Force is really what matters here. Despite that, the, the loss of the spirit of capitalism has largely benefited the right wing. And there are several major reasons for it. On our side, and I don't mean our side in the narrow sense, but the broad sense of the left, we have to face the music. We are forces of protest and resistance sometimes. The best example recently was Occupy and Madison was Conflict. But we are not a movement of ideas. We don't have an alternative to capitalism that makes sense to people. We couldn't even describe among ourselves what we really meant by the new society in any coherent way. We could say socialist, communist, anarchist, but we don't really have a serious conversation. And what's even more important is that in the national debate in this country, the left has disappeared. It doesn't matter. So that a David Axelrod, who is Obama's key figure, said in the prelude to the 2012 presidential election, don't worry about the labor movement, don't worry about the left, they're not a problem. Because we don't have any alternative. And one of the reasons we don't have an alternative is because we don't have a unified political formation of the left. And I'm not using the word party, although I can have that conversation with you as well. We don't have a, a unified political formation that speaks on every issue that comes before the population. We don't have a unified political formation that has a series of alternatives to propose to the rotten system that most people have to live with. Where 50% of Americans, for example, people who live in America, do not even have their heads above water. They're struggling. And what do we say? If we have anything to say personally, that's one thing, but we, as a movement, we say nothing. So I'm gonna make a, a, a modest proposal. Modest because it is going to bring us back to the 1860s and the first international. I'll tell you what that proposal is. In the 1860s, 50s and 60s, when Marx and Bakunin and anarchists and Trudeau and Guild Socialists 
wearing the same outfit. They did not make a membership distinction between anarchism, socialism, and communism. They had a party which had always divisions, always divisions, but never said to themselves that they were going to make their divisions on the basis of ideological differences. They were going to be in the same organization. We have to create a new kind of organization that is not the Communist Party, not the Socialist Party, and not the Anarchist Federations, but all of the above together. Yes. Yes. We have to create an organization that learns, that, that, that does what Amy Goodman does, and I watch her every night that I'm around at 6.30. <clears throat> which is that she brings people together to discuss the issues of the day. We have to discuss the issues of the day on a national level and then make real statements, organize around those issues. We have an innocent man sitting in Pennsylvania, Mormia. I know he's innocent. And the reason I know he's innocent is because my girlfriend knows he's innocent. But she said, no, but she says he will not tell who did it because he won't snitch. He's sacrificing his life rather than selling it. When Cornell West says, we have to learn something about force and violence. We have to learn a lot about force and violence. If we, are, if we don't have our own forces, and I'm not going to spell it out now, this is a long time to do it. If we don't have our own forces, don't have our own political formation, do not have our own national newspaper. You know, I'm not too, one of the things that in my biography nobody talks about is that I wrote a column for the Guardian of the United States for two solid years. I wrote 30 columns a year. I wrote 60 columns some of which have been incorporated in my books. The Guardian was the national spokesperson for the movement of the 1950s and early 70s. It died 20 years ago. We don't have a national newspaper, both hard copy and online. The Brecht Forum just went down the drain. I teach at the Brecht Forum and I have 30 students who are talking about revolutionary politics in a non-revolutionary era. And they come every week, and Michael Pelias teaches there, and um, Peter Bratzis teaches there, and there are other people who teach there. We don't have that on a national basis. We don't have schools. You think you're going to get schooling in a public institution or private institution in Harvard, Princeton? Did Cornell West learn politics from Princeton? Well, yeah, show him wrong. Yeah, great that's, show, great that, show. That's true. <laughs> But he didn't, but he was, but he was, he was in the Panthers. He never told you that. <laughs> That's where you learn. When I was a boy Stalinist, I was a boy Stalinist. I went to the Jefferson School of Social Sciences. I learned about the pre-Socratics and Aristotle and Plato that they were bad people, not the pre-Socratics. I learned Barclay, Hume, and Locke. I read Hegel, I read Marx. I'm not saying that they were, that their propaganda was correct. What I'm saying is that it exposed me, a 16-year-old kid, to all that stuff. We have to find high school students. We have to find college students. We have to find working class people who will do this. When I worked in the factory, when I worked as a metal worker, I worked in a steel mill. We had a study group. And we then took over the local union. And when I went to work for the old chemical and atomic workers, I met a guy named Tony Mazaki who did the same thing in his plant in Helena Rubenstein in Long Island. And he became the secretary treasurer of the Oil Chemical and Atomic Workers Union. You've got to have organization, otherwise we die. And we're almost dead. 
I'm going to stop pretty soon, but the one thing I want to say is that I have a book coming out in October. It's called Dead Unions and the Live Labor Movement. The, labor, the, the, the union establishment in the United States is dead. I don't believe it can be resolved and can be revived from the top. When Cornell says we've got to start from the bottom, that's the answer. We have to create a trade union educational league as was existed in the 1920s when there was no union movement worthy of the name because we have to begin to organize among the ranking file. But we can't do that unless we have young people and people who have the dedication to be willing to do the organizing. And in order to do that, we have to have organization. And I think the one thing that we also have to say is that one of the things that I learned from the Panthers, although they didn't invent it, was that if you have 80% of black people left behind by affirmative action and no child left behind and all that, and living in conditions of, of hardship and unemployment, and kids that are hungry, and Latino children in Los Angeles as well, in the Southeast. It is the job of the left to go into the communities and feed people. It is as occupied in Staten Island, and then there's eight people from the American Red Cross from the city government to the city of New York under that wonderful leftist, uh, Michael Bloomberg, <laughs> have failed. So that the problem that we face, and I'll, here's my last word, the problem we face is the building of communities, the building of horizontal communities as well as communities with voice is not going to happen because we have exercised our reliance on the state. When I grew up, I, was, I never thought the cops were my friends. Although I got, you know, I got used to my father in <laughs> But we have to have our own community that makes demands on the state, but also calls attention to the fact that this system is not only rotten, but has to be replaced. And what we mean by replacement, we have to learn how to spell out. Unless and until we do that, we're going to continue to have a nice annual conference. You, you should know this, by the way. The left one, its headquarters is in my office. But that's an organizational question. It's not located in some office building on Wall Street. It's in my office. And the volunteers come to this office, room 6115 at the Graduate Center. So that my center has become the host for the left forum because we have to have organization and we raise money. That's another thing, finally, finally. The left doesn't like money. It has an aversion to money. And so we go to foundations if we want uh, cash. Or we go, we get grants. One of the things I learned in the labor movement is that you raise your money from your members. You don't depend on the rich. Otherwise, they take over. Don't kid yourself. The foundations, the liberal ones, as well as the conservative ones, are really not interested in ideas and they're not interested in fundamental social change. The only group that will be interested in social change will be our political formation. Thank you. Thank you, Stanley Lerner from Cornell West, going to sit in the moral technique of that.
Um, so I'm going to start where Stanley was ending, actually, because the microphone. Okay. Sure, sure. Uh, this one. Oh, wait, if I go a little closer, here we go. All right, check. <laughs> Mic check. We can do a people's mic Um, I think we are living in a revolutionary spot, actually. Um, I think that, granted, with the electoral wins of the right, and there are some far-right groups, so that, that is part of the conversation. But what has been happening over the last few years, in particular since 2011, um, millions and millions and millions of people are organizing from <clears throat> Occupy here in the US, and in Spain, and in Greece, and in Turkey, and in Brazil, in Bosnia, all over. Um, and organizing in a way, rejecting uh, what's been bequeathed to us, rejecting a form of representation, re rejecting the relationships that are capitalism. Maybe not saying we're anti-capitalist, but rejecting those relationships. And organizing in a different way. So organizing not to say, okay, we don't want this, now we're gonna ask for something else. It's not about demands. I think what's so revolutionary, one of the many things that's so revolutionary about what's happening now is that people are organizing with goals without demands. So, so what that looks like is as people are organizing rather than say, and it's not being anti-reform, I'm for reform, I'm for revolution. But I'm also against reform and against revolution. Because when we think about reform, we think about asking um, and putting ourselves in a different position of power rather than feeling our power, which is what I think the movements have been doing around the world now. And yes, absolutely revolution, we have to get rid of capitalism. But we have to think together about what that's gonna look like. And when we talk about revolution, too often we think, you know, okay, we're gonna get the newspaper, build a party, take the state, and some kind of order. Um, and, and the taking of the state is part of what's being rejected. Um, not that we don't have to get rid of the state, we do. But the idea of just replacing it with something else is what these tens and hundreds of millions of people around the world are saying no in many languages. In Egypt, they say kefaya, you know, which is enough. We say yabasta all over. Um, so, I mean, I'm gonna be, we're gonna keep dialoguing, so I'm just gonna kind of put out the first thing I'm responding to is, I think this is a revolutionary epoch. I think there are tens and hundreds of millions of people acting similarly. And when I speak, I'm speaking as Marina, but someone who's been a participant in the movements and who spent time with people in the movements around the world, so I think, um, I kind of carry that with me and having spent time in Latin America, I feel like I'm speaking from, from some of that place as well. So just to kind of begin it, to even question what this moment is, how much potential and power we actually have uh, and everything. An immortal technique. Oh. Thank you. I thought the, uh, the title of tonight, because I play with words, can be interpreted very many different ways. Reform or revolution? Is that a question for us? Or is that a question that we pose to the people that don't want any progressive change? If you don't give us reform, pacification and placation, which a lot of times it is, you will get revolution. Therefore, to create reform, they're more than happy to see some reform come through because what they're terrified the most of is revolution. They want reform. They're willing to tolerate some reform, but they want it in small increments because they're afraid of a challenge to the system. The other question is reform or revolution? The brother here, or the elder here said, reform revolution. That's what we need to do. We can't just reform the, the aspects that revolve around us. We need to reform the, the, the idea of revolution itself. If we decide that we all of a sudden become a revolutionary minded individual, but we don't leave behind all of the privileges that we were born with or that we've assumed in life because of wealth or racial status in America, then what really do we have as camaraderie to be with the people that are suffering the most in the system? Also, one of the things that attracted me very much to this conversation is the idea that you can believe in God and be a revolutionary as well. You don't have to choose one or the other. And I say this because I have a lot of relatives that are born again Christians, and if you argue with them about the Bible, you'll be there all day. And it's a great conversation because I know the history of Christianity as opposed to just the, 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 
the gospel, but I remind people, remember, it's in the writing, it's in the history of this country, you know? At the, at the certain point, you'll find a person, would you believe them if they said, I know everything about America, but they've never lived here, right? They've read the Constitution, they understand sort of how it works. They said, oh man, yeah, I know exactly how America works, but you never voted in America. You never went to college in America. You, you never were arrested in this country. You never had a job. You never paid taxes. That's the issue that I confront sometimes when I speak to people who come at me from religiously fundamental views. You know everything about the book. You've read the Quran back to front and the Bible front to back, yet you know so little about the history that created the situation for that power to arise. I think that if we, thank you, I think that if we apply this same mechanism and we take a look at the history of the United States, we can see that capitalism and democracy, as I said long ago, are not synonymous. And as a matter of fact, they've been on opposite sides of each other since the advent of the republic. Um, Just to close very quickly, people blame hip hop and music and video games for violence in America, but I just want you to again read the history. This republic since its founding has known 20 years of peace. 20 years, ladies and gentlemen. 20 years, brothers and sisters. 20 years, mothers and fathers and grandfathers and grandmothers. 20 years, and they haven't been together, and they haven't been consistent. Don't tell me that music, that the poorest people who have no control over the system make creates violence. This country was violent since they first genocided the indigenous people that lived here before people came. I was, I was beginning by pointing out to my dear sister Maria about her claim that we live in a revolutionary epoch. We have to define what we mean by that. See, from what your description, it seemed to me you were describing escalating ways of awakening among everyday people in the face of our relative defeat, which took place in the 70s and 80s that the Reagan counter-revolution was just a symbol of poor and working people being targeted and we are still in the midst of that class war from above against poor and working people, both in the American empire and in other sites around the world. So the, when you talk about the awakening that's taking place, and I'm with you on that, I affirm that wholeheartedly. I'm not sure I would call that a revolutionary just to make it a revolutionary epoch. Because uh, you, first you got awakening, then you've got social motion, then it moves to social momentum, then you have something rare with the social movement, and then when you have a social movement, there's a possibility of revolutionary transformation. We don't even have a movement. We got some momentum, they got with Occupy, we had some motion. And we've got magnificent persons like yourselves who have been at it for a long time in terms of being in movement. That's different than having a movement. All of us have made a vow to be in movement until the words get us. That doesn't mean we, go, we have a movement at all. We had a movement in the 60s, a number of movements, that were co-opted, incorporated, or crushed, and just go to your prisons to see some of the warriors who have been there for 40 years. <laughs> Cointel Pro, FBI, CIA. That they defeated us relatively. We bouncing back, we a bounce back people. When I say we, I'm not just talking about black folk, but I always begin on the chocolate side of town. Oh no, because I, I, I am a black freedom fighter. And it spills over to my precious vanilla brothers and sisters. And brown and yellow 
and indigenous peoples, but I am a black freedom fighter. Why? Because my mama's black, and my daddy's black, and they have been the ones who have been rendered invisible when we talked about change and transformation and movements. But we have a broad enough vision that we are just as concerned about the Palestinian babies, just concerned about the Ethiopian babies, the Jewish babies, the brown babies, as we are the black babies, but it still begins on the chocolate side of town. That awakening, yes. Revolutionary epoch, aspirational. I'm with you at the level of aspiration. But those who are running things right now are vicious, cruel, mean-spirited, will crush you in a minute, and all you need to do is look at the condition of America's children, 22% poor, 40% of all children of color poor, that's not a sign of success for the left, that's not a sign of us in a revolutionary epoch in that sense, but the awakening is real, no doubt, and the art is always fundamental. It's no accident that last year was the first time in 50 years you didn't have a black artist who was number one on the pop chart of Billboard. Because all you got is bubblegum music. And right now the number one song for black, for black artists is happy, happy, happy. <laughs> the cartoonist music. They got nothing to do with Coltrane. They got nothing to do with Curtis Mayfield. They got nothing to do with Neil Simone. They got nothing to do with Gil Scott Heron. The more technique, is on the move. Their class is on the move. You can play those on the move. America by Bill is on the move. Where is the story and the narrative in the movement? Carol King, who are the, where are the Carol Kings? They can tell a story. No, it's just all about pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Access, access. Access to power. That's part of what the Obama phenomenon is. Access to power. That's the new crack for the professional class. Just give me access and I feel good about myself. What are you doing with it in relation to the suffering? What are you doing with it in relation to the struggling? So that I, 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 in some ways I affirm what you said, but I'm calling into question the characterization of revolutionary epoch, and I'm with you wholeheartedly. I'm blessed to be on my brother's album on Martyr. Well, we had a good time with you, I tell you. Oh, yeah, we had a good time. Well, this is going to retire artists, absolutely. But the role of artists fundamental is not just God talk, but it's what you do with that God talk. Because most God talk is profoundly dangerous. Deeply dangerous. Even with our new Pope. I like the Pope talking about the poor. I like his temperament and spirit. But he still had a profoundly patriarchal institution, profoundly homophobic institution, profoundly hierarchical institution. We're tired. We have to be critical in that regard. And I say that as a revolutionary Christian. This is probably better. Um, I want to take up one, one statement you made. I am not confident any longer that it is possible to actually predict, even with lots and lots of activity, genuine reform. And the reason for that is, when I said that capitalism has lost its spirit, and there's a highly concentrated, there's a high concentration not only of wealth, and not only a concentration of capital itself, but a high concentration of power. What I mean to say is that the struggle for reform has to be transformative, not little reform, such that the system begins to shake. And I'm going to give you one very small example. Suppose, for the sake of illustration, we had a movement that fought for the six-hour day. We would create more jobs than all the government programs combined. People are fighting to get work, to get hours in the fast food industry. They get six hours, but they can't actually get health insurance. But if we fought for the six hour day and fought for it in the factories, fought for it in the service institutions, fought for it on the street, 
we would have a different kind of situation. I'm using this as only one example. The problem is that's not a little reform. People did, in fact, die to the fight for the eight-hour day. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, they did. They died. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Other persons died. That's right. That's right. And people died to organize unions when the unions were coming up from the bottom. So that if we actually had a serious attempt to organize Walmart, you would see how difficult that would be in terms of force and violence. That would be another small reform. Only, only, only a million workers in Walmart don't have the, the way to live. $8.88 an hour. Mm. But it's not going to happen from within the official trade union movement. It's going to have to happen from the outside. Where from the outside? Now, I want to say one more thing and I'm, I'm going to stop. We've had movements. You're absolutely right. And there's an argument that I make in my later, this book on labor, which I just finished that we should not take power in the, over the unions. I, I don't believe in that. But I don't think it's going to work. But if we take power of the unions, we're going to have to break the law. That's a different kind of power. But our problem at this point is that we have to be realistic about what happened to the, what happened to the landless peasant movement in Brazil when a workers' party coming out of the official trade union movement broke the landless movement. We have to look at what's happening in Bolivia, where the Bolivian government, which everybody thought was hot shit, is now developing fossil fuels to be able to survive as a country because you can't have a a socialism in one country. I learned that from being a boy Stalinist. You can't have we don't even have a Latin American economic union. So we have to be very careful about our characterizations. I think we're at an interesting point. When Cornell says there's a lot of awareness, I think that awareness is there. But what can happen with the awareness? It can go in three directions. People have tremendous awareness and they go to the right because the right has a spiritual message. And it's not necessarily a religious message, it's a message of redemption. We don't even know the word redemption on the left. Although there are some leftists who did know it, Benjamin, for example, right? Uh, the second place that they, people can go is that they can go into despair. Mm. And they can retire from politics, even though they have a tremendous amount of understanding. Hegel talked about that in 1807 in the Phenomenology of the Spirit. He called it the unhappy consciousness. You have the unhappy consciousness because you don't think you can win, you don't think you can do anything, and so on. The third possibility is that we develop a spirit, not of reform, but of revolutionary fervor. Mm -hmm. That people begin to say, it is not acceptable for us to take $10.10 an hour and small reforms even if they're offered. Because that's not a reform even, by the way. That we we need to have fundamental change. And the only way we're going to get it it's not by resistance alone, although I'm for resistance, not by protest, although I'm for protest, but we have to have a conception of what is the good life. And your point is correct. In order for everybody to have a good life, some of us are going to have to give something up. And when we learn to give something up, to have a good life for all, we really meant that we want to have equality. Not ten dollars and ten cents an hour, but equality. Then that's going to mean a fundamental, massive redistribution of wealth, even for the people like Cornell and me who make money. I'm serious. You make much more money than I do, but that's. (laughs) 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 But no, but you know, you know what I mean. But these are things that we have to talk about. We're unwilling to talk about about wealth and power. We're unwilling because we don't have the least idea what it means to have any kind of genuine power in a society which has deprived us of even our citizenship. You think the people of Katrina had citizenship? Mm. You think the people of Staten Island had citizenship? They didn't have democratic citizenship. They could have voted for the same old, same old, but there was no citizenship. They had no power over their own lives. 
And that's what participatory democracy really means. It means you make the decisions over your own lives. You do not depend on the state. You do not depend on powers from above. That's why in the 60s we had a movement. So I'm Matt, and I'm where we are now. Um, a friend and a compañero from Uruguay, where Mr. Benchy is right here, um, also talks about societies in movement. And he's talking about what's been happening in Bolivia, and Argentina, and Brazil, and the, since, since the late 80s, since 1989, not coincidentally, but we're not going to go there right now. Um, and societies in movement, not social movements in the traditional sense. So it is partly why, as people are organizing, it's not around the forms of organization that we've seen in the past, um, because they don't have the same claims on institutional power. People are not looking to the state or institutions of power for change to happen. So they're not reform-based movements. It's people looking to one another. So anyone who was part of any of the Occupy assemblies or went through a really long whatever discussion, but you're facing each other, you're looking at each other, and that's the place, that's where we're locating power. We, tens, hundreds of millions of people who've been organizing in the last two and a half decades. Um, so societies in movement creating this revolutionary epoch, but revolutionary in the sense of everyday revolutions. That's something coming from people in Argentina. So thinking about how we're transforming our relationships our lives, using forms of direct action. Not just having nice assemblies, which is good, it's very affirming, it's very important to feel a subject, but then doing concrete things. Um, and so, for example, looking at Latin America, the Recuperated Workplace Movement, um, which started in Argentina, it's now in Brazil, it's in Uruguay, it's in Europe, there was just a meeting in Marseille with 150 people, there are a number of recuperated workplaces in Europe. Recuperated meaning, they use that language, meaning taking back what you see as theirs. So working people, rather than facing unemployment at an empty workplace, take it over, not asking, not demanding. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, all over in Greece, I was in Thessaloniki with the workers in Bioma, and taking the workplace and saying, no, this is ours, we're gonna run it, but we're gonna run it differently, we're gonna run it horizontally. Um, and there are now 68, actually, just in the last year in Argentina. So it's a phenomenon that's increasing. This is not the alternative, this is not the revolution, but this is exercising our revolutionary muscles in what it's like to live a value system different than the capitalist value system. So, so that's what I mean when I'm saying this epic. People are not saying, please give us our job. Well, also, I think I agree, because we're not going to get the jobs anyway, so why are we even going to ask? I think it's not necessarily ideological, it's just the reality. Um, so we're going to take it. We're going to do it. The housing movement all around the US, I was recently in Chicago, it's incredibly powerful in Chicago, Spain, all over these movements where people are not saying, please give us houses or please don't evict us, you know, taking it part from the 1930s in the US, it's like, we're not gonna allow the eviction to happen. So neighbors come together in these horizontal centers and they block it, they don't allow the eviction. So again, this is the power is with each other, with neighbors, we're gonna not, allow a person to lose their home, a family to lose their home. And people are succeeding. They're retaking homes that are abandoned, talking to people in neighborhoods, retaking neighborhoods. That's the power, that's this different moment. That doesn't mean that later there's not a negotiation with a bank. Often there is. But that's a different order of a conversation as far as where is power located and why we don't have demands, but we have goals. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, 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 I. You know, I, I, I think that's not only a powerful point, but it's, it's something that is often overlooked when those of us who usually are targeting the nation state and targeting traditional forms of organizing. I saw it in Madison, Wisconsin, with the landless movement taking over various houses and so forth and so on. But like our dear sister Cecily, sister Cecily who's on her way to jail three months coming out of the Occupy, but let's give her a hand. Give this to Cecil a hand. We want to take care of it. But even in the context of the Occupy movement, where you have this kind of society in motion, when the nation state targets you, you still need protection. She still needed the lawyer's deal. She needed to set up a constitutional right. She needed our voices, and she continued to get our voices. And that's when you talk about it's a different order, a different level, and at that point, we're in much deeper agreement than I thought at the beginning. I'm, I'm glad you clarified that. <laughs> yeah, because I see exactly what she's saying now in a much clearer way. Because 
we do need protection. The nation state is going to keep track of you no matter what form of motion you come up with. And therefore, you're going to need protection. It's like when Angela got in trouble as a communist, right? She needed protection by bourgeois, progressive lawyers and some revolutionary ones like William Cunster and others. She needed that protection as a communist, even though she didn't believe in the legitimacy of the American political system, she should be a protection. That's going to be true even for those in the society in motion, but it's a different way of people relating to one another that calls into question the dominant values that the nation state incorporates in the big place. Is, is that? No, no, that, I, that, that, that we, we, we agree about this thing. <laughs> of course. See, the example, the example of, 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 of Argentina and of uh, France and of Athens, the example of people taking over the workplaces that have been abandoned has, has one example in the United States, which is in Chicago. And that example is when the United Electrical Workers began to play around with the idea of taking over a window factory that had been abandoned by the, by the company. After they got a victory of, uh, of, of uh, severance pay. But I was in Flint. Several years back, I was a visiting person, scholar something, whatever they call it, at the University of Michigan in Flint. Flint, Michigan, is the birth of industrial unionism in the United States, right? I mean, it's, and you saw factory after factory after factory shut down, and nobody thought about how do we occupy the factory and how do we transform it into a place where people can work. And there was, there are huge, huge uh, brown fields in the middle of the city of Flint, which are dangerous in, pollution, in terms of pollution, that are not being attended to. The problem is what we call the radical imagination. The Argentine workers have the radical imagination. The radical imagination says we are going to occupy the plant and we're not simply going to occupy the plant to get recognition from the boss as they did in Flint, Michigan in 1937. We're going to occupy the plant because we want to work and we're going to take it over. So we need a whole system in the United States of co-ops. One of the things that bothers me about Occupy, that is Occupy Wall Street, I met with some of the organizers who said they weren't leaders, you know, the old crap, you know, no, we're not leaders, we're just, you know, plain old folk. They were not just plain old folk. And I met with them and I said, look it, what are you gonna do when it's dead of winter, when the movement is cleared out by the, by the, by the, by the city, not just New York, but you know, 18 mayors, right. 18 mayors. Well, same and, phone call. Yeah, and Holder was Holder was was um, was basically coordinating that. What are you going to do? What's going to happen with Occupy? And what they gave us was was horizontal networks will depend on horizontal networks, and 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 we don't need an organization. And I said, with all due respect, you don't need an organization to to get into the mainstream and buy for leadership of mainstream organizations, but you need an organization so you can continue your work. And they said, and this is, this is a quote, if we agree with you, Stanley, six of them, we agree with you, but if we did that, we would split the movement. And I said, good. Sometimes you have to have splits in order to go forward. If all we have is unity, and that unity means we're going to be paralyzed, then we don't need that kind of unity. And our problem is, is, is that our problem is not simply a question of tactics of organization, but our problem is really what it is that we think constitutes the exercise of power. Now, I'm not opposed to running election campaigns. I one of the signers of Howie Hawkins for governor. The only real candidate for government by the way is going to be a, well, he is. But that's not the key. That's one of the places. If we have a lot of places, and some of them are workplaces, and some of them are neighborhoods, if we really do, in fact, think of ourselves as people who are not going to take leadership in the narrow, old-fashioned sense, but are going to be the catalyst for 
for the movement that we're talking about, we can be powerful and we can be important in terms of the revival of the movement. But as long as we're still talking about, oh, Obama's no good, so we have to have somebody better. Oh, da 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 da. You know, if, if that's all we can think about, and, and de Blasio is going to disappoint, so people are going to say, well, we need a better mayor. No, no, no. The state is the state is the state is the state. Let's face it. That's really the problem. And we haven't come to, we haven't come to terms with the state. I would be for Sarisa taking power in, in Greece because it would be a tremendous object lesson. I could be proven terribly wrong if they kept power. But I don't think so. That's that's a position. That doesn't mean that I'm that I'm, I'm I'm happy in that position. I'd like to be able to say, oh, we can have reform. That 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 in Germany. Delica can actually uh, gain power and have reform. I think that day is over. And we have to debate that question, why it's over. One of the reasons it's over is because the system is no longer flexible. The setup is really tighter and tighter and tighter so that even now we can have a surveillance program by the federal government under, the, under a black president, well, let's face it, that everybody is in surveillance. And there's been no mass protest. We think the Center for Constitutional Rights is going to solve that problem? I love the Center for Constitutional Rights. But that's not where it's going to, going to end. We got cold pink, too, We got cold pink. It's just a, but we have the other guy. We have the other guy. But it's not a mass here. You said mass here. There's been some motion on, the, on that issue. Chris Evans. I, I just wanted to say, um, as a person that was down at Occupy for a long time, I pretty much from the, the first few weeks, it was interesting that the criticisms that I saw us garner. And I remember that what he just said about a revolutionary imagination is incredibly important because we have to have the thinking power to throw the things back that they threw at us. Someone came down there and there was a, a group of, uh, of producers, I don't know if they were from Fox, but they were from a, a series of right-wing institutions. And they said, oh, this is all a bunch of drug addicts. And I approached them and I said, well, wait a minute. What do you mean drug addicts? You mean like people that are sick with an addiction, that are ignored by that government, that are criminalized and then thrown into prison to make money in a prison industrial complex where they feed a system that they don't cure themselves? Is that what you mean by that? And they said, oh, this is, this is homeless people. It's just all homeless people. I said, oh, homeless people. That's pretty cool. You mean homeless people like people that lost their homes through a predatory loan because someone who had decades of, it, of experience robbing from people. You know, my father told me something when I was very young. He said, uh, uh, I, went, I came out of a police station, I was, I was arrested for something stupid, and I said, I just lied. And he said, don't you ever do that. Don't you ever lie to people that are trained liars. <laughs> no, true story. He had, he had a friend of him who came from Russia, Russian immigrant. He came from... He played chess and he came to America. He went to the, the supermarket with my dad. He goes, oh, I know how you beat us. You know, we just have wheat and sugar and gray and brown boxes. You have wheat and sugar too, but it's sold by a talking frog and an anthropomorphic image of a tiger. It's great for you, but it's not really great. I, I thought these things were interesting. He said, if I brought you, because I used to play chess as a child. I was a really good kid, I'm really nice as a chess. I still play now. I take the money. <laughs> I give it to the court. <laughs> he asked me if I brought my professor friend here. He's Russian, but ironically, he plays no chess. He's never played chess in his life. He goes, could you beat him? I said, I'll wipe him off the board right now. I'll give him a rook and, and a knight, and I'll still take him in three moves. <laughs> my father said, because you know how to play the game. You're dealing with people that know how to play the game. You're coming in there thinking that you can just lie and, improv and have some improvisational uh, semantics to get your point across. I think these things are incredibly important because revolutionary imagination is what independent hip hop, which is what I re represent, was built on. The ashes of a crumbled major label industry that failed. It failed just as bad as capitalism. Capitalism didn't just fail here in America, it fails everywhere else around the world. But when uh, a socialist or a left-leaning regime fails, people blame the economic system in the third world. When a capitalist system fails in the third world, they say, well, no, no, the regime was just corrupt and crooked. 
as if the ideology that put the regime in power and kept the regime in power and had 50% of Cuba's GDP come in the form of graft payment before the revolution there, as if that wasn't a corrupt institution. So I think that what's important is that that revolutionary ideology be spread amongst all of you because as a revolutionary, you don't need to just be a rapper or a professor. You could be a revolutionary doctor, a revolutionary lawyer, a revolutionary uh, a, a medical professional, a, a member of independent media. And what's important to tell young people, because I have young people that roll with me and they don't want to come to forums like this. They say, oh, that's what I'm all heads talking about. What you gonna do? I've seen younger faces on cash. I'm not going there. <laughs> How do we build a movement? Bring your children here. Bring your grandchildren here. Bring your great-grandchildren here. Bring your cousins, bring your nephews, bring your nieces. Remember the story of Sid Harta? His father kept him away from sick people, from poor people, from old people. He didn't want to see it. So when he thought, his mind was blown. But he's the exception to the rule. He's not the rule. Most people that grow up like him completely have a skewed view of exactly what poverty is. They think it's the people who's, who are poor as fault that they're poor. It's just their fault. You know, if you just wanted to be rich, you'd be rich. They have these catchphrases, these things that don't mean anything. We're gonna reintroduce him to society. How are you gonna reintroduce a kid to society that never been a part of society, right? We wanna support the troops. No one wants men and women in uniform to die, but the question is not do we support the troops? The question is do we support the policy that someone that never served in the military doesn't understand war, doesn't understand the lives that are at stake, do we want them to be in charge of the policy? Independent, and independent hip hop reflects all of these thoughts and ideas because in the mainstream they would never let you say this. So what happened? We wanted to fund it ourselves. We wanted to do things that hadn't been done with hip hop. So we took the music that we made, we took a percentage of the proceeds from an album called The Third World and we built an orphanage in Kabul in Afghanistan that's still to this day functional with the Omid uh, International. And, and the purpose of doing this was to show all these millionaires and, and alleged billionaires in hip hop, if I can do that, an individual who knows nothing about school, I don't, I, I have a, I'm honored to be on this panel because I have a high school diploma and that's just about it, you know what I mean? It's my dude, man. it's my dude. I don't know where y'all are. Me too, me neither. Well, I got a girl's number in the back of my head. I was a wild kid. But I, I just want to say that, um, I really do like the idea that we need to think outside the box and the idea that even though you know uh, uh, France isn't burning and the Bastille hasn't been smashed open, we do have a revolutionary ethic. We have the ability to communicate with people and have camaraderie and learn from other people's struggles that we never had. We have the opportunity to look in the past and see the way that the same game has been run on us. And I just want to close by saying that to use the chess metaphor, we need to get to a square that's not on the chessboard to win. So everybody, we don't just need your participation, we need your imagination, we need your ideas. Revolution can't be funded just by bake sales and rent parties anymore. We need people with entrepreneurship that isn't self-destructive, that doesn't create a toxic product that kills people. Thank you.
boss, you know, in your mind boss, so the revolutionary imagination, so how do we think like that? And, and Stanley, I'm going to push a little bit, I mean, I, yes, we should have an organization conversation. I'm not going to do that now, but I agree. We need some kind of organization. We need to figure out what we are before we get there. So we need to have the conversation. Um, but uh, you started talking about recuperated workplaces, and somehow it went to elections. And I think we get sucked, our, radi our revolutionary imagination becomes radical, then it just kind of settles. And we need to keep it in the revolutionary space and keep the living sin padrón. Think about the world we want to live in and act it out now. I mean, that's when people talk about prefigurative politics. It's not anti-revolutionary. It's very much about being anti-capitalist, but it's thinking about our relationships now and how we're acting in a way that's prefiguring the society we want to live in. Uh, whether that's non-hierarchical relationships, whether that's about sexism and racism and all of the oppressions in, in our everyday lives and in the world we're creating. And I think that's also the critique that's coming out of these new societies and movements um, of not building parties, of not taking the state in the traditional way, because it's all about creating these new relationships, not asking someone else to make you free, but are doing it right now. I have a degree, but I never went to school. Okay, explain. Oh, I, I, I'm supposed to. Well, I got thrown out of Brooklyn College after one semester. I did go to Brooklyn College for conduct on becoming a student because I, because I uh, was part of a demonstration in the dean's office that I could, it's a long story. And, uh, and then 15 years later, somebody said, if you really want to get a degree, you should take a graduate record examination and uh, maybe then uh, you could get into the new school. Maybe they'll give you a, a, a bachelor's degree. So I took the graduate record examination. I took the graduate record examination. I walked in, I said, what the hell is this? I just took the graduate record examination. I did pretty well. And so my friend who was a member of the faculty of the new school went to the dean and said, why don't you give this guy a degree? And the dean said, I'll give him a degree on the condition that he goes to the graduate school. So he gave me a degree, and I went to the graduate school, and, uh, of the new school, and I spent a semester there. I had to say that. And then I ran out of Germans. And I had to face American sociology, so needless to say, I had to quit again. And I never went back. But I, but I never spent four years in an institution. I spent one semester in college, and I spent one semester in, in graduate school. And I found out how to get a PhD without going to school. And, uh, <laughs> but look, that's just that's just one thing. I did it because there's a place called the Union Graduate School, which is accredited now. And when I went there, they paid me to write my dissertation. And it's a book that it was a dissertation that became a book of mine called Science is Power. And it was a section on Marx's theory of technology. And the two, the two chapters in that came out of my dissertation. But see, the thing is that I was somebody who had spent a lot of time in the factories. I spent 10 years in the factories, and I spent seven years as a union organizer. And I had written a few things for the nation. And I had written things, you know. So they said, you know, this, and then, and then the GREs was a, a clincher. They said, this guy shouldn't have to go to school to get a bathroom. Well, I mean, sure, they wouldn't do that today. Now let me make let me make my other point, okay? <clears throat> there's some there's a word that I haven't used, and I, I'm not going to debate radical versus revolutionary imagination. If revolutionary works for you, that's great. But we do have a problem of subjectivity. We have a problem, and the word subjectivity is a philosophical term that you know very well. For now, it's really about whether people have, collectively and individually have the confidence that they can take control of their own lives. That's the political definition of subjectivity. It's not enough to hate the system. It's not enough to go on a demonstration now and then. It's not enough to vote for this one or that one, or even for that matter to, to, to go on strike or occupy a plant so you can get recognition from the boss. What subjectivity really means is whether you believe that your hatred, your understanding of this, the fact that the system doesn't work and doesn't not only work for you, but won't work for other people as well, as well as for your children and your grandchildren. Whether that, that kind of understanding can be translated 
into direct action. That's really the problem. You were talking, Maria, about direct action. You are talking about whether people are really willing to do that. And there are reasons why people aren't willing to do that, even though they have the tremendous understanding. And so when we talk about revolution, we have to understand that the transition from understanding and, 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 and how the system doesn't work to being able to take action over your own life is a very difficult moment. Now, some of us on this platform, I'm sure all of us on the platform, have dedicated our entire lives to changing the social and historical reality within which we live. And one of the problems that I have to face, because I'm going to have to soon write my memoirs, and I have no reasons for that. No, no, I, I really say it's serious. Uh, is to ask the question, how is it that some of us do in fact decide that we're going to take the brutality, take the defeats, take the being outside the mainstream, take all that, all that stuff, and, 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 and show wrong, and some of us say, I lost this battle, we didn't get elected, we didn't win this thing, and therefore I'm, 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 I'm retreating. How does, that, how does that happen? Is psychoanalysis one possibility that we can understand? Does Freud and Marcuse tell us some things about that? I think so, but not enough. We have to go further, because they were then, they were talking about subjectivity then, and we're now talking about subjectivity now. There's much wider understanding now how bad everything is. But I believe that we still don't have, and I don't think it's only this country, we still don't have liberation from the traditional forms. And I'm trying to argue in terms of organization, we have to get rid of some of those traditional forms at the same time as we have to talk about organization. We're still tied to elections, we're still tied to, to, to stars, most of our stars, including some of my very close and very good friends, operate as essentially petty bourgeois entrepreneurs because they had no choice to be. That, you know, you know what I'm talking about, Cornell. I mean, it's really true. I had done it. When my first book came out, 85,000 copies, everybody read False Promise. Everybody read False Promise. I got, I, I got 90 invitations a year, and I took 45 of them to speak. I got tired of that shit. I said, I can't do this anymore. But two, three years of this, I got out of it. But the problem, obviously, is that people, the only thing that we have now are certain people who voice what our understanding is individually, mm -hmm. who have access to the media and access to audiences. And basically, what we don't have is a collective spirit, not only of anti-capitalism, and I agree entirely with Marina, but what do we mean by the good life? How do we want to live? What do we really want the society to look like? Uh, but second, second. Second. Can, can I just push on this issue? Yeah. First. Uh, like just a minute to go for each person oh. before I respond as we summarize oh, up. Um, and and Stanley just gave you his actual Oh, I'm going to do a CP time thing here. <laughs> a minute don't mean nothing to a black man. <laughs> don't mean nothing to that. But Stanley raised the issue of subjectivity. I think it has something to do with memory. And it has something to do with what it means to live in a financialized economy, a commodified culture, a commercialized educational system was obsessed with just narrow conceptions of success so you don't have critical thinking connected to memory. And so there's a possibility of subversive memory that feeds that subjectivity that produces the precondition for any talk about social change, which is courage. And courage is in short supply in a market-driven society, short-term gain, obsession with the 11th commandment, thou shalt not get caught to get over by any means and get more cash and chase the Benjamins, chase money. And that's true across the board. And so we're living in a society where so many young people don't see concrete examples of sustained intellectual courage, moral courage, political courage,
America for. What we had in the 60s was, we had people who in front of our very eyes were enacting and embodying a level of courage that became contagious to, to, to such a degree that we were willing to live our lives to the end, never forget them and their courage, and therefore try to pass that on to the younger generation. That's the challenge, you see. And that's by means of example, individual example, as well as collective example. So we end up with that society in motion. We end up with the legacy of Curtis Mayfield, Nina Simone, at work in hip hop with you, Chuck D, and Rod Digger, and the others, and see it in the educational system where our teachers are trashed and marginalized and want to think critically but pushed aside because they don't fit into the narrow successful paradigm, and then look at the celebrities, most of them well adjusted to injustice, well adapted to indifference, but obsessed with look at me, look at me, the opposite of courage, being intellectual, political, Carl Vicks know what I'm talking about. He's been courageous for 50 years, and still going strong. really concretely, a short anecdote. When I was in Greece in 2011, they translated a book of people's voices from Argentina talking about the movements um, that I put together. They were saying, oh, but the factories, that doesn't work for us. I mean, Thessaloniki, Greece. No, that's, that's a cultural thing. That must be Latin American. For us, you know, workers will never do that, right? So just a few weeks ago, I was in Thessaloniki, Greece, in a factory that workers are running together horizontally to support the community. So it's the, not to underestimate ourselves and to think really concretely about, okay, so maybe that's not appropriate for your situation. There's strike debt. People are talking about stopping paying their debt, whether that's student debt, credit card debt. We just do it. We just do it. And so that's the, the courage that you're talking about. Very specifically in each of our lives, defend your neighbor, don't let them get evicted. Figure out ways people are going to school that they don't have to pay for it. There are, we can do this very concretely in our lives and it's exercising this anti-capitalist muscle, creating that alternative that is the living sin patron, that is going to create the revolution every day and longer. We're going to end with a more of that question. Can't drop the mic, huh? I just want to say that uh, in my studies and my research in uh, revolutionary movements, whether they be in America, whether they be in China, Cuba, Russia, I always saw the same depressing final act, that after the oppressive system had been overthrown, after the royal family had been destroyed, because, ladies and gentlemen, if you've ever read uh, fairy tales, you've read history books, there's a big difference, right? There's so many, you know why there are so many noble and righteous kings and queens in fairy tales, ladies and gentlemen? Because that's the only place they really exist. <laughs> Real power demands brutality to keep force. Don't forget that those two things go hand in hand. If there is an illusion of freedom in those sort of societies, remember that it is only an illusion and that a hand is waiting right underneath it in case you get out of line. So to me, when I look at this, I see an opportunity for the most important thing here, which is an intergenerational dialogue, which is an understanding that we need to pass on what we have learned to the people that are coming out of the dirt now, and not just people who look like you and have the same background as you. Learn from other people's struggles and teach people who have no connection to you because whether you know it or not, there's no such thing as a race. We're one human race. We're all connected to each other. And therefore, we should be introducing these radical or revolutionary imagined ideas to all of us. The other thing I'll say is that when we talk about traditional leftists having divisions based on small details of ideology that they see as a deal breaker, I think that this is something that has been the ultimate 
uh, monkey wrench in the game for people. The, the venture capitalists of the world, they don't like each other either, ladies and gentlemen. Newsflash, they hate each other. They despise one another. I don't want to be in, I have a billion dollar mansion just so I can get away from that guy. And whoever said business isn't personal, never was in business. It's always personal, ladies and gentlemen. The thing I'm trying to say is their unifying degree is to think how much money we're gonna get when this is all over. What we should be thinking is we need to join up because imagine how much freedom we'll really have when this is all over. Imagine how much transparency we'll have when this is all over. And I, I just wanna say that, that it is incredibly important um, for people to understand that even the most uh, powerful of us, even the ones of us that seem to have the most conviction and the most strength and the most passion, even we doubt ourselves at times. So never doubt yourself and think that's the end of it. That's a natural thing, but being worried about your doubt is a waste of your infinite imagination, ladies and gentlemen. Take that doubt and that worry and push it and structure it towards making a change within your cipher, within your area, in this petri dish society we call the United States of America. I love you and God bless you all. <laughs> Well, what do we, please, we only have four elevators, so please have a seat. <laughs> what a way to start our conference. Let's give them all, all a good hand. Come on, guys. Maria Sitka. Amy Griffin. Please sit. Please don't leave. Or stand up, but don't leave. I have an emergency announcement. If I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning. I'd hammer in the evening. Oh, Lord, this is it. Oh, 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 oh,